Hey, this is Jason from Misery Index, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, episode 165. And today's guest, we're talking to Jason Netherton. He is the vocalist and bassist for the band Misery Index, a kind of death metal grind core band from Maryland, I believe. Today, we're going to be talking to him about what got him into metal and pretty much doing a rundown of his discography. So, without further ado, let's go talk to Jason. Hey, what's up, guys? I am here with Jason Netherton from Misery Index. How are you doing today, Jason? Good. Good morning to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and probably good afternoon to you over in Finland. That's correct. Three o'clock here, so mid-afternoon. Yeah, Yeah, so how long have you been living in Finland for? Uh, seven years. Oh, nice. Give or take a few months. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so what, what made Originally you from Maryland, Maryland. Yeah. And so what made you decide to move to Finland? Was it something about the city? Is like, this place is awesome. I want to live here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was part of it, um, you know, through the years, like visited here and, you know, starting in the early nineties, I had a lot of friends here, spent time here on tour and otherwise. And, Got to really, uh, um, you know, the culture and the people. But I mean, it wasn't until later in the 20, 2010s or whatever when I, I met uh, a lady who brought me over here, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, to, man. So, kind of like the format is, I want to talk about like your musical journey and sort of do like a rundown of your discography. But before we go into that, take you back to young Jason. So, kind of growing up, what were like the first bands that? got you into metal and what made you want to be a vocalist and slap at the bass? <laughs> uh, well, like a lot of kids in my generation, you know, growing up in the eighties, got into the heavy metal and stuff, you know, the bigger names, you know, Iron Maiden, Scorpions, Metallica, even stuff like Dokken and Rat and so-called hair metal. Um, that was the first attraction in, in what got me into the music and then it was kind of like the progressive, you know, gateway drug to the harder stuff. Found out about Slayer and then about death metal and things like that by the late eighties. And, but as far as bass, it was definitely Steve Harris from Maiden. That was like the one that for me, like he's the guy that kind of made bass cool. Cause back then it was all about shredder guitarists and, and you know, and even drummers to an extent and bass players always were kind of like the silent kind of, I don't know, backbone of a lot of bands with Steve Harris. You know, when I saw like the live after death video, when that came out from the power sleep tour, yeah. just watching him run around and being up front, being prominent in the mix and being a prominent songwriter. He's amazing. Well, which is kind of like made it cool. Everyone was playing guitar where I was living. So I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll try this bass thing. And then went with that, you know, and then later on um, when the death metal started taking over for me, I was really into like the first Gorguts record, of course, Chuck Schuldner. Bolt Thor was a big influence. Basically, I went this kind of mid-range death metal vocal path, you know, with the raspy kind of, I always thought Martin Van Drunen uh, from Pestilence and His Fix, like he, he was like the, the pinnacle for me as far as like tone and delivery. I mean, no one else sounds as like in so much agony when they're singing in the Martin Van Drunen. So that was like the, <laughs> Perfect. the one I don't, I guess I got a little bit of him and John Tardy in, in my voice, but uh, yeah, those, those were definitely the bigger influences. All right. And so kind of like a, what I was doing my research, I was going through metal, your page on metal archives. I believe the first thing it comes to mind is your, is a damnation and 1990, you did the one grain of truth demo. So tell me about that. <laughs> that was like a high school band kind of thing that through high school years was jamming with these guys locally. And we were just playing a lot of covers and stuff. When, you know, bands like Maiden and Metallica and Slayer. And we started writing original by 89 and we recorded that demo in 1990. Um, that's when I started 
playing with uh, John Gallagher. That was like kind of our high school band. And um, <clears throat> we put out the demo, but by the time the demo came out in 1990, we were already more into death metal, even though that demo was kind of like traditional metal, maybe a little bit thrash light. <laughs> We were playing that stuff, but we were our hearts were more into the heavier stuff. So at that point, we we started uh, looking to start a new project with uh, you know more in the death metal style. So yeah, which would then go that's into how that one ended. <laughs> yeah, so tell me exactly. about exactly. Yeah. So, so by ninety one, yeah. we were. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I could yeah. By ninety one, we were. Yeah, by 91, we were looking for a, a drummer to kind of explore some of those ideas that we wanted to do with the, the death metal. So we looked for a couple, like a year or two years, and we couldn't find one. So John just ended up playing the drums on the first demo because he was a kind of a rudimentary kind of get it, get the job done, kind of get the job done kind of drums. Um, and anybody who hears that first uh, dying fetus demo can hear that kind of primitiveness of it. and. For some, it's part of the charm, but that was the first incarnation. Then by the second demo, we found the drummer and a guitar, a second guitarist and kind of forwarded ahead with that. Yeah. And so tell me about like infatuation with malevolence. Like this, this is pretty much is about as old as me. So tell me about like making this, this, which is a sort of like the second demo. Yeah, that's the um, that's like a demo compilation of the first two demos. But yeah, the um, the second demo was kind of when you know we found the form, figured out what we wanted to do, more focus, um, better songwriting, better performance. So it was a progression towards that kind of like slammy, brutal, slightly tech kind of uh, formula, which Dying Fetus continues to kind of perfect yeah yeah and then of course you started playing locally and stuff and then i believe your first record the first la label that fetus was on was a uh, pulverizer Records. so how did they find the band well it was a weird time because like uh death metal kind of imploded like as far as like its popularity by like 93 94 and a lot of bands started doing other stuff and it was kind of a glut of bands in, in the scene globally that were kind of copying the more popular bands so there weren't a lot of labels that were really interested in the kind of death metal we were doing anymore so it would, kind of went back on the ground in a way and and um pulverizer pulverizer was just one of those like uh you know basement kind of label dudes that his name was randy and he offered to put out the first fetus record purification for violence and and uh we jumped on it we just to have somebody you know put the put it out back then because we never thought it would ever do anything or you know more than the small circle we were in you know we were trading trading shows with bands in new york like internal bleeding and in ohio and stuff and going out to illinois but we thought that was going to be the height of everything and just getting down on a small label like that was was a big deal. Yeah, and so like, what is the thought process going into making the the debut full length Dying Fetus record? Because it has some great songs. I think they still play like Blunt Force Drama, Skull Fucked, the fucked like all these songs are fucking brutal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was it. Just kind of represents the time we were trying to push the boundaries of like extremity. Nowadays, it's pretty normal to have like those kind of themes but at the time we're thinking oh what, how can we make this more, more brutal and more you know transgressive or whatever sonically and musically and lyrically and we just kind of went there and that's just we were thinking we were taking influences that we you know we were into bands like internal bleeding suffocation broken hope baphomet these kind of slammy kind of death metal kind of proto slam death metal stuff that we like the breakdowns the hardcore breakdowns we were into a hardcore a lot yeah but we still you know wanted to have like death, a death metal sound and a death metal approach with just little bits of elements of those 
so that's kind of the first like you know stab at an album or whatever with with that kind of intent in mind yeah and on this i know you covered a napalm death uh, scum fuck the week what made you deci- guys decide to do like a napalm death cover Well, Napalm Death was also a huge influence on us then. And and I think we just had seven songs and we were just like, yeah, we need another song. Because in our minds, like eight, you have to have eight songs on an album to, to make it an album. So for whatever reason. Yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, we always like Scum. You know, the first version, recorded version of that from Napalm Death is really rough, really primitive. We really liked the version that was on the live corruption um, video, the more, you know, with a little bit more heft and heft to it and power. And so we kind of took it as just a song that'd be kind of cool to make our own just for a, a album closer kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. And then when, when Purification Through Violence first came out, did you just started like touring outside of Maryland for the first time, or was it still just kind of local at the time? Um, up till then, up till '96, actually, we we done like one-off shows where we drove up to, to uh, Quebec, did fe- some local festivals in Quebec and Montreal. Went to Long Island, as I mentioned before, and, and did shows with some of those bands, Pyrexia and Eternal Bleeding, and went out to Ohio and Illinois. But it wasn't until '96 um, when we got a call to do a, our first tour which was with uh, cataclysm back then they uh, um they had a kind of a different sound it was a little more straight up kind of hyper blast death metal that they call it um and they had a, a couple albums out of nuclear blast already and monstrosity so luckily we got asked to open that tour for like <laughs> I think we got like a hundred bucks a show or something, but we got a chance to go out to California and back and, and, you know, and, and uh, experience the tour life for the first time. And, and it was, it was fantastic. Nice. Usually the first time tours are always the most fun. <laughs> cool. And then of course the next, next dying fetus <clears throat> album killing on adrenaline. I like that album. Blah, blah, blah. Did you feel like pressure to like follow up purification through violence? Because usually with the debut, you have like your entire life to write. And then there's a lot of hype with the first album. Did you feel like pressure at all, all the follow up? I don't think we ever felt pressure. It was just because we were just in our minds. It was always just a fun thing. We never took it that seriously. We didn't really take it seriously until later on when it became more of a full time thing. But all through the nineties, it was just something fun. You know, getting together in the basement, writing songs, and just putting it out. It was just kind of a. It was, it was. I mean, actually, Killing's kind of like my favorite. I don't know, that was when we got Kevin Talley on drums and and everything kind of came together. And it was just like we could write any kind of riff and he could play any kind of drums to it. So that's when things really opened the door for like songwriting. So it was like everything was just wide open then as far as like the potential of what we could play. So, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, I think. I think next up you did the uh, grotesque impalement EP because usually like like when bands like do like an EP I always feel like that's like a sneak preview of what next to come for the next full length or kind of like I use a video game reference a kind of like a side mission so how did the grotesque impalement EP come to be um it was just something we did for fun I think um it was like it was by it was like ninety nine. So at that point, we were together for like eight years, and we kind of wanted to do a little bit of a throwback to the um, what we were doing on the first demo. So we re-recorded two two of our first demo tracks and uh, did some cover songs. One from Baphomet, one from uh, a, a Maryland hardcore band called Next Step Up, and uh, it was just something to put out as a kind of holdover for the next record. Yeah. Um, and you know everything. There's a lot of momentum at that time. We played a few like Milwaukee metal fests, and, and things were kind of going really fast and starting to get bigger. So, yeah. And then your your last album it was, was uh, the, yeah, you're saying. 
sorry. It's just, I think there's a little delay here, so <laughs> it's all good. All right. And then then destroy the opposition, your last album, but with the band. I actually like this album. So what was the thought process going into making this album? Uh well that one I think's got a little more serious. Like lyrically, they became more focused, like more concrete, kind of real world issues came into play rather than more like the fantasy gore stuff that was kind of more in the early mid nineties. So in that respect, I guess it's more mature or whatever. I don't know. The songwriting got even better, more perfected, because we'd been playing with Kevin uh, at that point for like three years. And, you know, everything was just like coming naturally and easy. The songs were just coming out at rehearsals and, you know, and, and all the work we'd done in the underground through all, all the 90s kind of paid off at that point because that's, finally a label was interested in this <laughs> after putting out the last few more or less ourselves so um, when relapse was interested and in, it was like the right place right time kind of thing because in 2000 death metal and extreme metal were kind of coming back on the radar again as far as like in the metal consciousness or whatever so things kind of rolled with that and yeah, and we toured on that like for the whole year, all of 2000. It was killer. Yeah, but yeah, but then of course 2001, you sort of left Dying Fetus. How hard was it to leave the band? It was it was tough. I mean, it was just the point in my life where I had other things going on, personal and professional or otherwise, and done the band for 10 years at that point. So <clears throat> stepped away. Um, it all was fine. You know, John was always kind of like the driving and songwriting force in the band. So everything, everything was cool. Yeah. You know, and I was away for like a year and started doing demo stuff with, on my own and got back into it with Misery Index more or less. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And how'd you get to know everybody in Misery Index at the time? Because I know you formed in 2001. Um, well, first of all, the, the first incarnation was just something of a studio project with Kevin Talley also, who who also left Dying Fetus at that time. And um, a friend of, mutual friend of ours, Mike Harrison, he was involved and got together with him and we just demoed out some songs we had and you know, the response was so good. It kind of started taking on its own momentum again and and uh, became a more full-time thing. So. Yeah, tell me about like the first, first and the labels TV. were sniffing around. <laughs> yeah, that's the one we put out. That's more or less the demo or whatever the the first release. So <clears throat> we put it out ourselves on our own imprint, and uh, that's the one that kind of got some labels interested, and we ended up signing the Nuclear Blast like uh, the next year. So. Yeah, because I know you also did record. like, yeah, because I know you also did like some a couple of live so songs from eighty-eight point nine Wears in Boston. So did you just want to decide to like throw in some live tracks to like make it like complete or something? Yeah, I think that version there might be a. I don't know if that's the one from Europe or whatever. Yeah, it's from Anarchos Records. Records. Okay, that's ours. Okay, that's the one we did. Oh. I think it's like a that's like a second pressing or whatever. We added those as like bonus tracks to kind of I don't know, have a little extra on it. What's a live session we did at a radio station in Rhode Island? Yeah, yeah, but then of course you the 2003 you did like the the first album Retaliate. And so were you like kind of like nervous now now being like you're actually making your you're sort of like the driving force or like the lead the lead of the band this time to make a new band yeah um, it, was, it felt weird um but it felt natural too i mean in in dying fetus i, I was kind of like the center point in that one as well when i left so it wasn't something it was already something I was kind of familiar with or whatever. 
when misery started. So it was a kind of continuation of that in a sense. But at that point, I also was getting more into like punk and hardcore and grindcore and things like that. So those influences came more heavily in the misery index than they were in fetus. So yeah, I couldn't hear it in like like servants of progress or even order upheld distant descendant devolved bald or even bottom fingers is just i could definitely hear that little grindy influence yeah it was a big thing for us i mean not you know just in trying to develop our own identity i felt like there was more to explore there as far as like the influences, which you could trace back to like bands like Napalm Death and Terrorizer, Brutal Truth and things like that, um, Disrupt, This Hero Is Gone, it's also a big influence. So I felt like taking those kind of uh, like sounds and kind of like merging them with death metal would give uh, bear fruit or whatever, a little more interesting kind of approach to things. Yeah, and I know that this year does mark 20 years of Retaliate. So how how do you usually feel about it now as opposed to when you first put it out? And sort of like a two-part I want to ask is, is there a chance we, we could get a celebration of this somehow, maybe do like a tour or something where you play it start to finish? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been out a while. It's like, it's kind of been overshadowed. And in later years, like some of the relapsed albums, like Traders and Heirs of Thievery, seem to have more like durability and popularity than that one. Um, but, you know, some of all those fans that, that were got into a spectrum, that's like some of their favorite stuff. So we always try to play at least one or two songs from that, you know, even, even this far along. But I don't, I don't know about a, the whole thing. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. You know, never say never. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But then in between Retaliate and Discordia, you did the Descent EP, which I think is just a, definitely one of my favorite EPs from you guys. So how did this come to be? Um, At the time, like like I said, we kind of had this like kind of like hardcore punk kind of mentality. And we really wanted to do like a lot of DIY, like smaller releases at the same time we were doing the albums to kind of, I don't know, explore different like songwriting ideas or, or just to kind of stay active and stay creative. And that's just the output of like um, wanting to do, keep things like progressing and not waiting too long for another album. We just, we had the songs and we thought it would just be cool to do an EP like that. And we had the ability to put it out ourselves and our own label. It was kind of in our contract. So we wanted to do that and, it came out killer. Uh, Kevin came back to the band briefly to record that with us, so that was cool. Yeah, and I I think it's great. I especially love how there's like the four part descent, which go uh, like I just love how it's split. It, it's thirteen minutes, but you like split it into like four parts, like sheep and wolves. Like, what made you decide to like make it like split do like a four part kind of thing? Yeah, it's cool. I like to explore that again kind of maybe with the next album get some kind of concept thing going again if we could find like the right i don't know thing to base it on the right story or myth or what have you yeah. but yeah it came out killer yeah and then of course the ne next album discordia yeah i like love this album but of course you're on relapse records same labeled as fetus is now now so how was how is it like get being making this album Uh, that one was a little, we had changed the lineup um, to like what it is today almost. We got Mark in the band and Adam came aboard for that record. And um, it was like, it brought in a different dynamic and the songwriting process was a little more uneven. And I think a lot of the songs are cool, but a lot of them are kind of like, a lot of the ideas weren't fully expressed or expanded. And it also has like a little bit of, I don't know, the mix was a little bit rushed. So it's not really our favorite record, um, but it's out there and some people really like it. So we're stoked about that. But yeah. it was definitely one of the more rougher kind of like songwriting recording processes. And we, you know, we learned a lot from that moving ahead. <laughs>
Yeah. And the and the cool thing thing is you actually recorded it in in Atlanta, which is like north of where I, which is like a little bit south of where I'm at. At so so how was that? What was it was like at was it like working at a Harry Breakfast Productions? <laughs> yeah, that was AL Levy's uh home studio. I don't know if you know AL Levy from Doth. Oh yeah, I know Doth. Or, uh, he was also a recording engineer and he and he has a he does a lot of talks, you know, on, on engineering and things like that. But we worked with him on the Descent EP, and so we went back there again. But yeah, we were there in North Atlanta for like a, a month or so, and we had a good time. Yeah. And um, good memories from that, for sure. Yeah. And then I know also in 2006, you started up another little kind of kind of band called Quills. I know in... I think literally the same day as the Discordia, you did, did, dropped the self-titled Quills album. So, how did you be, end up making a, making a, that kind of little EP? Um, something we did locally. That I was asked to join with the friends in Baltimore in the Baltimore scene. I think the drummer is from the band called Swarm of the Lotus. The guitarist is from Ruiner, um, and the the vocalist was Evan. Um, who's currently in miasmatic necrosis and uh, neolithic. Nice. But it was just like kind of one-off thing we did. We did a few shows. By the time we were also busy doing other things, it, it kind of fizzled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then then kind of like going going 2008 eight, eight is uh, Traitors – probably like in my opinion my favorite misery index album so what was the thought process going into making that album uh well after ever having learned from like whatever we weren't happy with with discordia we kind of went went in with a lot more focus wanted to get make sure the songs were a lot tighter a lot more fully formed um everything we just wanted to make better so we went ahead with it. We recorded at God City with uh, Kurt Ballou. May of 2008 came out that fall, and uh, it was it's definitely one of the one of the sta staples in our discography. And we still play like three or four songs from that usually every tour. So yeah, and I know yeah, this year definitely yeah. stoked with it. Yeah, and I know that this year does mark 15 years of tra Traders. I feel like, in my opinion, I feel like it's like you guys' most mature out. But um, especially with like the in the terms of like the songwriting sense, I feel like every you have all definitely have evolved since since the Overthrow EP till till of course Traders at that point. Yeah, I mean, that was a you know Adam and Mark had been in the band for three years at that point, so we finally got all the influences in line or whatever, and the songwriting kind of reflects all of our different interests and. It, and it has a kind of about much more balance to it and um and depth, I think, than Discordia did. So we learned a lot from that. And and I think tr traders and airs of theory were like kind of a good it really captures like the you know, what we were really going for at that time, the energy and it yeah. came out killer. Yeah, and then tell me about making Heirs of Theory. I I like another great great album from you guys. I definitely think you sort of I continued in the same vein as uh, Traders. Yeah, it was. I mean, it came out only less than two years later, a year and a half later. So that was like when we were really touring a lot, and we were you know in the rehearsal room together all the time, two or three days a week. So things were moving fast, and the songs came out quick and. And there's a lot of momentum. So we recorded that one locally, literally just a few blocks from our rehearsal space. Um, with uh, at Right Way Studios in Baltimore, where Fetus also recorded most of their recent albums. So it came, it was super tight, you know? Yeah. It's. Yeah, and I definitely feel like yeah, you don't like, killer. <laughs> yeah, definitely feel like you like it continues in that same vein of Discordia and Traders, and especially in like the eye melting speed and the ferocity with the perfect amount of like melody and rhythm. And I feel like you could get 
like it's like a album that you can like get up and mosh at headbang in your living room where you could just sit with your eyes closed and let just let you relax i just feel like it's a probably like a you guys's most balanced album to date yeah perhaps you know it's we toured a lot for that one too um it was a it was a transitional time it's the last album was sparky so but yeah we still play you know i think in and out of the set we might do like six or seven songs from that still so yeah and it's then definitely important yeah and then the next album the killing gods this and this is by by unpopular opinion the album that got me into misery and next and of course you got signed to season of mist wreck so how how was it like working with th them i feel like that's sort of like i would consider like a, the next chapter in the misery index saga yeah, i'd say that's correct that was like it was definitely a transitional time like i said um sparky was out darren morris came aboard and the lineup's been the same ever since and his his uh influence came on he's, he's a lot more of a, a classical type uh lead, lead player and guitarist and and we channeled that and we, we went into like a little bit of a slightly different, more epic kind of uh, darker direction so with the songwriting and with, with added a lot more melody. And, uh, you know, we're stoked that we we think the album may be a little too long, but we just put everything we had written at that point on there. It probably didn't have to go on. We probably just could have put the maybe eight songs, but it came out pretty long. And but otherwise, it it was it was fine you know we hadn't put anything out for four years at that point so we wanted to put all the music we had out but yeah and season of mist um who were we were with two records they were they were killer great label great independent label so very supportive yeah and i especially love like the Ur Ur faust faust intro which goes right to the the calling and then going into the oath i kind of like the the two little instrumentals on tr which are track one and three i just think it's a really really kind of a way to like sort of like like build or sort of like a great build up into the, like the next so song i just think like it's just perfectly leads and amazing which is the one thing i love about the killing gods cool yeah that was like i mean that was like again where we kind of like uh flirted with a half album concept where we took like um, Goethe's Faust, um, the story of that, and kind of mod brought it into the modern context and kind of had our own interpretation of it and thought it kind of fit the lyrics to have this kind of like gothic, I don't know, uh, parable of, uh, yeah. of uh, the folly of um, hyper individualism or whatever into <laughs> the modern context. And it it was cool. I mean, it definitely fits with some of the more melodic uh, passages in that whole uh, section of songs. Yeah. And then I know in 2015, you started up uh, Asphalt Gra Graves. And then I, I know in, the, of course, 2016, you did the um, the new Primitive album. So how did you end up forming that band? Um, those guys came to me, the guitar player and, and the drummer. Um, they they reached out to me and said, "Hey, we have these songs. We've been sitting on them. We just need, we've been looking for somebody to do vocals, and we thought you would really fit it." So uh, I was like, I listened to it. And I thought it was ripping. So I was like, "Sure, send me the songs." And I, you know, wrote some lyrics and recorded it, and we found somebody to put it out, and I think it came out killer. Just. You know, it's that kind of ripping death cry, which I really, really enjoy. It brought me back to some of the classics in, in the 90s, Gas Sock and things like that. Yeah, and I was like, listening. stoked to do it. I don't know what's going on with it now. <laughs> but, yeah, I was just was about to ask that, that, that if there was like any plans to make another album or you're, you're just like mainly focused on with Misery Index. Uh, I've, I talked to the guitar player uh, a couple, maybe a year ago, and he said he had another song, another riff. And, you know, everybody's busy with work and family and stuff. So I, if something comes along, I'll never say never, as you said before. But... <laughs> yeah. 
But then I going into 2019, back to Mithri and Drex, you did Rituals of Power. I thought that was a great follow-up to the Killing Gods. And I noticed like during this time, you definitely take like a few years because I know, know before that, 2014, you did Killing Gods. And then before that was 2010 with the Ears of Mithri. Did you really like to take your time to like really just hone in your craft to, 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 to make these albums? Well, I mean, it's just it just kind of parallels changes in our own lives. Like we've, you know, some of us have gotten married and families and, you know, we have other jobs too. So things like that have, have gotten in the way. So we're not really touring full time anymore. So, and we also, we don't live together in the same city anymore. So you know, the other guys are in different cities in the U S and I'm over here. So things just uh, go a little bit slower than these. So, <laughs> In those days when we were in this, you know, rehearsal room three days a week and writing songs, you know, frantically, it's kind of more, it's definitely more refined and things take more time and we send files back and forth and we meet up like every few months and go over what we have kind of thing. So it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still definitely one of my favorite albums from 2019. I, I especially love uh, the choir, You're Invisible, New Salem that even the title track are pretty much some of my favorite songs nice yeah and and then of course of course their latest latest full length album complete control another great great album one of my favorites from last year your your first album on century media yeah so what was that, that like like making that album Um, well, that's the pandem pandemic album for us. Um, you know, we were on tour in Europe in 2020. We were out with Napalm Death, and we did a month with them. And the last day of the tour uh, was in Cologne, Germany. We played a show on a Sunday night. The next day, it was in March of 2020. Everything was shut down. And we didn't see each other for maybe a year and a half or something. So everyone was just kind of on their own and writing and and uh, it's it's kind of the outcome of that. It's it's definitely the most, it's, um, you know, in that time also, yeah, we signed with Century Media. So I guess, you know, it kind of had a similar kind of approach to as we did with Rituals of Power. It's kind of a continuation of that sort of thread, I think, um, sonically and lyrically. You know, themes of power and control are both on, both both of those records are kind of, Cir circumvent that theme and you know we've kind of experimented a little bit differently with a few different kind of songwriting ideas but uh we think it came out killer and uh and we're pretty happy about it so yeah and did you feel like re-energized with the album yeah somewhat um i think that the the re energization is, is still ongoing. Um, it was kind of a bit of a haze with the COVID thing, and we got out this year. We actually did a good amount of shows already this year over three months. We did maybe fifty or sixty shows, so we're kind of getting back to form now, maybe. And and we were, you know, during the last tour, we had a lot of time together, so we. You know, we, we put our heads together and started planning already for the next album for next year. We want to get this one out a lot quicker because yeah. we don't want any, any more four four year breaks or something. So, yeah, and especially remember when I first heard the song Infiltrator Daters, I love that song. It also has like the bit of the hard hardcore feel, but with the, like the death metal and stuff. Do you feel like that death grind, grindcore, and even hardcore come from the same place and spirit and sort of like the same kind of attitude? Death grind and hardcore definitely. I mean, death grind could be an offshoot. It's like you know where grindcore, which came out of punk, kind of merges back around into metal with death metal. You know, two extreme forms on the family tree. You know, growing back and interlocking together. So, I mean, that song is definitely more straight up hardcore kind of song. It could be you know like it to uh, like a like terror or something, but for me, it goes back to more like SOD and kind of the 80s crossover stuff like DRI and things like that which were also close to my heart growing up so 
but it's in that spirit, you know? <laughs> yeah. And kind of like to going into like the songwriting, I think I, one thing to note is I love like the lyrics between like the politics and class struggles and even dissent. And the, the, when it comes to making lyrics, do you have to like put yourself in that sort of like a mind frame to, to, to come up with lyrics or just the lyrics just come like naturally or organically? Well, I take them very seriously. So it's definitely about getting the mindset. You know, I, I like to use a lot of like, metaphor and and wordplay and things like that and imagery and bring that all into the alliteration is important like i don't know i i, I was really into the lyrics in the 80s and stuff so you know the best metal bands to me were the ones that had that more poetic sense and and uh and i really you know i, I like the lyrics to rhyme i'm really i like that kind of wordplay and and it takes time to sit down and go through it you know, when it comes to the themes, you know, the, the themes of like, uh, you know, injustices of the world, which are ongoing. And there's there's never a shortage of horror in the world to sing about. So for death metal, to me, that's the lyrics rooted in, in reality and, and putting light on those horrors and talking about them and criticizing uh, power and things like that. Those are natural kind of things for me in my background so that's a defining theme for misery index i think and although we have kind of ventured off here and there for like um more some slightly more fantasy themes i think at the core you know those kind of things are always going to be what we're going to talk about but you know at the same time i like to, to get more nuance into it and and maybe talk about them in different ways and, and even bring something more of a story theme back as we talked about the concept thing. So maybe that's something we could do with the next record. All right. Yeah. And one of the sig signature parts of the misery index sound is of course, like your vocals and as well as Mark's vocals but with having like to the, doing the two vocal thing. I know there's a lot of bands that have like the two vocals bands, like of course, dying fetus nowadays days and other bands like lacuna coil, Lincoln park bands like that, that have the two vocals things. When it comes to like you two, you and Mark sort of like singing together. Do you have to like be on like the same page, like emotionally to figure out who, how this part, part you sing it or this part Mark sings it. So how do you two make it since I know you've, it's been like that since probably Discordia. Uh, just, we kind of work it out when we're, you know, after the lyrics are done um, and, and we demo them. Like I usually write most of the lyrics. So I'll do the demo. I say, hey, why don't you do this part, this part, and this part? This will probably be cool. We'll do this chorus together kind of thing. And, you know, we just try to keep it balanced. And, I mean, our vocals are both kind of mid-rangey. Um, so there's not like a big dog, little dog, super, you know, discernible. I mean, you could tell, I think you could tell us apart. But at some points, maybe they do occupy the same kind of like range or whatever sonically. So... We try to, be, you know, sometimes certain songs are more personal to one of us or the other. You know, they like Mark wrote New Salem, and he sings almost all of it. On the new album, I wrote Complete Control, and I sing almost all of it. So it's kind of like a case-by-case -case thing, I guess, ultimately. All right. And kind of like talking about your bass playing, because I know you we've heard all, like, the bass player jokes and memes and all that stuff but but i love like how you don't gravitate towards flashy bass playing but instead i feel like you find ways to link what the guitars are doing with the melody and what the drums are doing with the rhythm but in a way that's very creative so so in your opinion like what is like your thought process to playing bass or recording it oh uh, well for me i mean i've always been uh you know the, the bass to me is like the foundation it's it doesn't need to be like a for a you know whatever conventional metal death metal music it doesn't need to occupy a you know front and center space of more been more like the workhorse kind of approach to where it's about uh you know just playing as tight as possible and, and keeping things uh keeping the the ship afloat if you will and um i've yeah i've never really gravitated towards trying to, to be anything because i've also been more vocals like i've my vocals is also, so I, I think of myself more 50, 50, 
like as a singer, kind of like a death metal vocalist and a bass player. So there's always been a kind of like balance between the two, maybe where like I identify as both. So it's not really a, you know, the, I'm not like a, a bass player's bass player or what have you. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And when it comes to like, like singing and playing bass, Face. do you ever like when it comes to especially like the recording or writing of the songs do you ever like to figure out like okay when when you're when you're singing like where your hands are per fret like do 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 yeah a lot of, a lot of just comes with repetition um it was a lot easier to get that repetition when we were living together in the rehearsal space all the time but um now it's a lot of it just comes naturally. Like once the once the lyrics are so well imprinted in your brain, they come out without thinking about it. So it's more just about the playing and the vocals to me are just like a stream of consciousness thing over top of it. So all right. I mean, it's just come from doing it for so long, I guess. <laughs> okay. And sort of sort of like a, a couple more questions to sort of wrap things up. I'm always curious about like your gear. I'm always curious what kind of basses you play, like the strings, pedals, amps, and all that good stuff. I play Warwick basses. I have a Warwick, Warwick stage streamer, which is uh, over there. Um, I got through, I got into Warwick through uh, Shane Embry from Napalm Death. Um, we were when we were touring together. He, I was playing his uh, a few times, and I really liked him. So, joined them three, four years ago. And uh, we've used Ernie Ball strings uh, for years. Um, as far as pedals, I just use an overdrive pedal, an MXR, and uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's just. A pedal board I, t I just take the pedal with me and you know a lot of times we're just flying in to do festivals and things and just i just plug that into whatever and go so to me it's not a i'm not really a big gear guy with like tons of pedals and tinkering with things all the time i more just plug and go i guess all right with a, you know a good mxr pedal or a, or okay. a sans amp pedal or something like that all right and sort of like in the end to sort of wrap things up what's next for misery index i think you sort of mentioned about your sort of working on like the net next album or bringing up like the ideas so what's next for misery index in terms of like new music or tours and stuff well we just finished like like i said the big run of tours and we did the spring tour with um in europe with uh year the knife and on earth and then we did Festival run in the U.S., you know, the Milwaukee Metal Fest, Hell in the Harbor, Northwest Terror Fest. And, and then we just did a festival run and club shows in Europe. So we, we at this point, we kind of cleared, cleared our schedules for the rest of the year. We're going to write and record in the spring because we really want to like, keep the momentum going and with the songwriting and things like that. So that's next. Awesome. So thank you, Jason, for this conversation. It was great to be able to talk with you today. Is there just any final words you want to say to the viewers that are watching this to close things out? Yeah. Um, if you've like, uh, if you followed us for years and you're, you know, you support us, thank you very much. And if you, you know, if we're new to you, that's cool as well. You know, check out the new stuff, check out the old stuff. We, you know, uh, Look for a new album next year. <laughs> That's great. So everybody, Jason from Misery Index, we'll see you next time.